Hello, it's Scott Manley here. In a few weeks, a science fiction movie is getting released, which I can claim to have had a small part in helping create. The movie is Stowaway, and it's written by Joe Penna, also known as the Mystery Guitar Man, and Ryan Morrison, who I don't know his alias. But when they first got in touch in 2015, they had most of the story in nearly the final form. But they'd been taking on or talking to advisors about space stuff. You know, the astronauts, engineers at JPL, experts in spacecraft design, and somehow they found me. I'm not a rocket scientist, I just play one on the internet. But I do frequently point out mistakes in science fiction movies, and yeah, on my Twitters I will suggest how they could have been fixed if only the producers had gone and asked me. So now they asked me. Yes, uh, a C-list YouTube celebrity with a funny accent. But yeah, I you know I totally jumped at the chance. Uh, all, I mean, I like actually uh, Joe's work on YouTube, so I was like, great, I'll totally work with you. So we had, uh, you know, I read the script, we talk, had a few phone calls, I sent a lot of emails over the last few years, and in the end I couldn't spend any time to get, you know, the spare of the time to get face-to-face -face with the crew and help them design things. But now I've seen the final product, I'm actually really happy with what I've seen. And there's a few things that, that I suggested I actually made it onto the screen, uh, which is very cool. But before we dissect the whole movie, we're going to have to wait for it to be released. But we do have a trailer. And the trailer does have a few things that I want to talk about. Now, obviously, there's going to be some spoilers in here. But... Uh, yeah, we've only got a two minute trailer, so there's a lot more of the movie which I'm not going to cover until after it's released because I don't want to spoil anything for you, right? So anyway, yeah, if you have watched the trailer, there's a few things that are very obvious. First up, it's a movie set in space with a very small cast. It's got three astronauts and the titular stowaway on a spacecraft going to Mars. And of course, there's not enough oxygen to keep the extra passenger alive, which means the crew is going to be faced with some really tough decisions that will really stretch their acting skills. Now, anybody that knows science fiction will recognize the parallels with the classic story, The Cold Equations. Originally published in the 1950s, it's a classic story about hard decisions being made at, based on cold, hard math. There's no other way out of the situation. So yes, the story very much falls into this mould, although it's worth noting that the cold equations itself isn't actually the first example of this particular storyline. You know, there's examples that date back to the 19th century. But let me address a couple of responses I've seen in comments to the uh, trailer talking about the science in the science fiction. Firstly, lots of people are looking at the trailer and seeing that the characters are walking around on a spaceship as if there's regular gravity. And some of you have immediately dismissed the movie as fantasy because artificial gravity isn't a realistic technology. But if you look carefully at the trailer, there is an explanation already in there. There's a couple of shots showing the spacecraft. and. What you actually see are three modules joined together by very long cables, and the whole thing is rotating to simulate gravity. And this idea of joining spacecraft like this and spinning them is a real concept. In fact, there was a test of tethers in orbit with a Gemini 11 and the Agena target vehicle. They docked them together, then they undocked, and they were tethered. Now, originally what they wanted to show was that they could keep the Gemini passively stable by having the Agena down near the Earth and the uh, Gemini up here, but orbital mechanics wouldn't cooperate with this idea and the tether kept on going slack. So instead, they showed that they could keep the tether taut by spinning the spacecraft and generating a tiny amount of artificial gravity. That It was like less than 1% of a G, but it was enough to show the concept. So in Stowaway, this thing is scaled up to a multi-module space habitat with a booster as a counterweight hundreds of meters away um, and the whole thing is rotating maybe a few times per minute. It is a very cool design and when I first saw the script, uh, the basic design was in there. I didn't have anything to do with that. But as I understand it, the you know, writers, they arrived at this design after, long after starting on the basic story, because they realised that shooting a movie set in zero-g would make a much more expensive production. 
So they wanted to try to keep the cost down. So the, first of all, they wanted, okay, gravity, let's have a ring-shaped spacecraft to generate artificial gravity. But there's two problems with this. One is that if you make the spacecraft small enough, then the curvature is quite extreme, which means that you then have to build a set that has big curves on it. And then you have to deal with the fact that people might need to walk around it. Now, for the movie 2001, they actually built a 27 ton centrifuge set for the main bridge of the Discovery, which uh, this whole thing could be rotated as they were shooting. And there's a couple of scenes in the movie where there's one actor walking around the bottom as it rotates, and there's another actor basically strapped into their seat so that they can go upside down. Uh, obviously, this is some amazing filmmaking. I mean, it's Stanley Kubrick, a director who would go to great lengths to shoot things the way he wanted. There's a joke that if Stanley Kubrick had been asked to fake the moon landings, he would have insisted on shooting it on the moon. But anyway, yeah, this costs a lot of money. But also from a scientific point of view, the small ring also would need to rotate faster. And that actually causes problems with the crew. They get dizzy because if they stand up and sit down, the rotation actually changes between their head and their feet. And that makes them, gives them nausea. So if you then said, well, why don't we scale up the radius of the habitat so you don't need to have curved sets and things like that. And the rotation is slower and the human body is fine. That solves those problems. But then you have the problem of explaining why the crew is so small on this massive ring spacecraft. Because having a small crew means a small number of cast members. But also from a storytelling perspective, it's much more plausible that if your crew uh, is supposed to be three and you have one extra, that's a much bigger deal than if your crew is, say, ten. I think an early version of the script actually had four crew members and a stowaway, and this was pared back to make the uh, scenario more plausible. So that's more or less how the writers came to this idea, which had a small module and a very long cable. Uh, they wanted to make a space movie and they wanted to keep the costs low. And moreover, once this design was settled on, it actually drove other aspects of the storytelling, including a really cool set piece, which we glimpse in the trailer, where the crew are in spacesuits climbing the cables between the modules. Anyway, I guess one contribution that I can say that I did make uh, was that I suggested in the design that they have a utility module in the middle because that's the place where the rotational forces are, are the lowest. So that's the best place to put your solar panels for your power generation. Anyway, during my work on this, I generated some of the first renderings of the design as reference. I, I used the power of Kerbal Space Program. I, I literally threw a design together in a few minutes and sent it to Joe and he was sort of blown away. And later I, I made a video showing the whole thing as a sort of corporate promo video to explain the operation of this. And that sort of brings me to another point, which at least one uh, journalist pointed out, why don't they just turn around, right? Well, we actually knew this would be asked and I wrote a really long email <laughs> explaining the math so that they would know. Uh, we hear that they've just left Earth about 12 hours ago and th with the crew in danger and the stowaway facing a two-year mission or death, surely it's better to just turn around and go home. And the simple answer to this is that they don't have the fuel to slow down and turn around. Now, if you do the basic orbital mechanics for a Hopeman transfer orbit from the Earth to Mars, then after you reach escape velocity and escape the Earth's sphere of influence, you're moving at about four kilometers per second. And that's what you'd need to turn around and go home. But to get into orbit and once you reach Mars, that only takes two kilometers per second. So a mission plan that was expecting to refuel at Mars might only have two kilometers per second of propellant on board, therefore unable to turn around. As it happens, the story ended up evolving to use a different type of transfer trajectory. The spacecraft is what's called a cycler, and that's a spacecraft which is on an orbit around the Sun that regularly brings it past the Earth and Mars. The idea is that you have a large deep space accommodations in this big orbit, and that thing never stops. The crew who want to travel from Earth to Mars, they, they leave Earth on a very small spaceship, accelerate up to catch this, dock with it, and they live in comfort for a few months. And then when they get close to Mars, they get back in their spaceship and leave and land on Mars. And the whole thing is, it means that you only need to boost this space hotel up to speed once. 
Um, Buzz Aldrin is generally credited with the Earth-Mars cycler. We actually sometimes call them Aldrin cyclers. He did the math and the orbital mechanics for, for this. But uh, he basically showed that they didn't need a huge amount of maneuvers to keep them in synchronization with the Earth-Mars windows. But the cycler concept in general is believed to originate in the 1960s with a guy called Walter Hollister, who looked at the cycler between Earth and Venus. Now, the downside to the cycler orbit is that it's more eccentric and the encounter speeds at Earth and Mars are higher. But since you're only moving a very small spacecraft up to speed and slowing down, it actually turns out to be a net win in terms of the amount of mass you're moving around. And of course, this feeds into the reasons for why the crew can't just turn their ship around and avoid making those literal life or death decisions. Now, because the Earth-Mars transfer windows don't line up with the Mars-Earth windows, you actually need to have two cyclers, one that's aligned for the outbound trip to Mars and another that's set up for the inbound trip back to Earth. But, but two is actually just a lower limit for a fleet of cyclers. You might need even more if you're designed, uh, if you need them. Like one of the important features of a cycler orbit is that they use gravity assists during close encounters with the Earth to twist the orbit around and make sure that the, the bigger orbit aligns with the uh, windows. And it needs to correct by a certain amount during this Earth encounter. And to get the, the more correction you get, uh, the closer to Earth you get, the more the correction is. But sometimes the amount of correction you need is so big that you, you would actually end up inside the Earth. And that's not good. <laughs> it's really not good. So in that case, the cycler would have to expend propellant in deep space to make sure that it can change its orbit enough to make the keep the orbit on target. Uh, now, ideally, you could get this down to zero, and there are designs which get your trajectory changes down to zero, but some of them, for example, have problems where they don't get to make it to every single uh, Earth-Mars window. And so you then would have to have extra cyclers sitting out there to make sure you don't miss any transfer windows. There are other designs though, which use multiple Earth encounters. So they go from Earth to Mars and then they come back and have an Earth encounter and then another Earth encounter. And because they've got two, they can use that to shape the orbit more efficiently and in theory, get away with a ballistic orbit. Look, regardless, by the time we see this uh, space station in the movie, it's been in service probably for a couple of decades. It's a lived-in vehicle. Uh, it might even have started out as a zero-G habitat and evolved over successive crews delivering new parts with each trip. Uh, all these crews will have left their mark. And if you look at the set design in the background, you can actually catch some clues as to these, these cues I, I gave to them. Uh, to be clear, the spacecraft being a cycler has like zero influence on the story. It's barely referenced in the dialogue. I think there's like one mention of it. It doesn't change any of that, but I just think it's really cool to see this hard science fiction idea outside of a hard sci-fi novel and a, a you know movie with Anna Kendrick in it that people might actually see and might learn something. So look, I, I think I'm leaving it there because we can't talk about much more without getting outside the trailer. I'm excited for it. It's um, it's not perfect in every way in terms of the science, for sure. There's a lot of things, a lot of compromises that did have to be made. But um, it's been a fantastic experience, and I really can't wait to tell you more about it later. I'm Scott Manley. Fly safe. Mm -hmm.